sound check one two three sound check one two three august 11th sound check 1988 someplace else but it could have been you that they were talking about in the movie, yeah? yeah before i forget maybe i should have this done now you can just sign here this is we're gonna we're gonna pay no there isn't Ron Barbosa. My name is Ron Barbosa. I'm the director of documentation and computerization of the Cape Verdeans, and we're here in Fairhaven. The date is August the 11th, 1988, and we're here to interview two veterans of the Second World War. Uh, to my left is Mario Rose. Morning, Mario. Morning, Ron. And to his left is Anthony Barbosa, who is my father. Morning. Good morning. I'd like to begin by asking. Marty Rose, uh, and just saying a couple of things about Marty. Marty was a Second World War veteran, a decorated veteran who was shot down during the war and was a prisoner of war. He also was an outstanding football player from the Bedford High School. He is part of the Hall of Fame there at the Bedford High School. And he's had many experiences in the Second World War. I'd like to ask him when he joined he was drafted and his experiences that first week or so. Um, I was drafted and went up to Fort Devens. Um, and um, there we had a uh, still in ranks and uh, the command or uh, the order was given for I can't remember the exact wording, what it was all colored soldiers or colored persons or Negroes, whatever, to step forward to paces. And I said to myself, if you can't tell a black man from a white man, I'm going to stay right where I am. So I did. So I went in with the white forces. No one ever asked me, to the best of my knowledge, whether I was white or black, except this one instance where the separation was made. And after that, there was no other questions as far as color line was concerned. Now, you say you were drafted, is that correct? Yes. So when you receive the draft notice to report, do you do you report someplace downtown, and then do you sign in, and they tell you to report for a later time? Yes. You did, did, when you sign out these forms, were there forms where you had to check off one or another? No, not, I don't remember that. You, you were... Dear friend, you have been requested by your uh, your friends to report for duty or some such thing, and you report it to a center where they check your name off, and you were told when you were leaving and where from, and you'd meet at that date and. Go what up. what year did, did were you drafted, and which do you remember the date that you enlisted? Offhand, no, no. Was it 1940? 40, 1942? In the 40, it would be in 40, I'm sure, 45, 40, probably 42, 42, I would think. 42. Okay. Let me just ask my father. My father is, uh, has eight children, eight boys. I'm the second son. And uh, the other son, one of the sons, the eighth son, is working on the project with us. My father was in the Second World War. He was born in Falmouth, Mass, and uh, he's one of 14 children. Is that correct, Dad? Right, yeah. 14 children. And many of his brothers and brothers were in the Second World War as well. Could you tell us a little bit about that? About how many? And uh, how many brothers? Well, I went in 1942 and was in 
Providence because my grandmother brought me up and I was living with my grandmother at the time. And uh, I can remember going to the center and marching through the, through the center with a group of recruits. And uh, I was kind of happy about it because my grandmother was a tougher sergeant than any sergeant I could meet in the Army. <laughs> so was, I figured this would be easy. And uh, it, it did help me a lot that she was such a strong person and a good disciplinarian. Because then when I got into the service, it wasn't hard for me to take the orders and to do what I was supposed to do. I was accustomed to that. I went to Devon's and from Devon's, I left with a group that went down to Augusta, Georgia with a chemical warfare outfit. And that's where we had our basic training. Was your experience similar to Marty's in terms of stepping forward and sending into uh, either the colored troops? Because the armed services in the 1940s, even before the 40s, the World War I, were segregated. Uh, were you enlisted as a black soldier? No, I was drafted, and uh, I don't remember this. I guess they recognized what I was, and, they, and I was in a black outfit. But I'm not. Uh, I'm glad that I was because it gave me a chance to see another culture because I was brought up in East Providence and I I had a lot of white friends and I went to school with mostly white fellows. I got a chance to see what the other side was and, and it taught me a lot of how to relate and to get along with other people. In fact, I saw a lot of black people who were really white. <laughs> They looked white because they had, because of um, the mixture down south. So um, I found it very interesting, and uh, it was a chance of getting getting away and living in another area. So, uh, did you enlist with with any other Cape Verdeans at the time? Uh, yeah, I remember my god godmother's son was in the group, and he was crying. He didn't want to go into service. Right. He was drafted. <laughs> he was, we were all drafted. What was his name? Do you, do you remember the name? Yeah, Cabral. So it's there was just Cab two of the Cabridians? Well, there might have, there, I think there was more, but I didn't, uh, I don't remember as much. Marty, was, were, when you enlisted, were there other Cabridians that enlisted that same day or showed up before that induction? I'm quite sure there were, although I can't remember offhand. I'm quite sure because, you know, we have such a large Cape Verdean population down here. Yeah. Um, the name of the fort that you went to when you did your basic training, which fort was it? I went, we went, went to Devons. So this is the same fort? Same, same fort. Yeah, fort Devons, yeah. That's yeah. the, uh, that's where we started from. And then from Devons, I was sent to uh, North Carolina or uh, South Carolina, I'm not sure, one of the Carolinas, for basic training. Uh, this was uh, basic training. It wasn't Air Force or any. Just basic training. Then fall service. Then fall service. Then from there, uh, I went to gunnery school in Colorado. That's where we started Air Force training. Was this all a blank piece that you, the Fort Devons piece, and then the basic? You were you were still segregated. In oh no. Oh, you were well, saying I, good, I you was in, in the, the white unit. In the white unit. Did you ex did you experience any any type of uh, never never had problems. any problem had any problem. I uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, after we got set up in crews, after we after we got through our training, we went we were sent to Tampa. Tampa was the uh, Tampa, Florida would send uh, would would receive all the pilots from pilot school co-pilots, radio men, mechanics, armor gunners, ordinary gunners, tail gunners. They would be all in this pool and they would draw a first lieutenant for, he'd be captain of the ship. Second lieutenant would be, a, well, they were all second lieutenant at the time, would be co-pilot, bombardier, navigator. And that, that's a crew. So you put a crew together. Well, and my crew, my second lieutenant was darker than I was. Uh, and he was from South, he was from, from Virginia. 
then as far as tan goes, his tan was a deeper tan than myself. So, he was yeah. a black then? Yes. No, no, he was... He was a white man, it was just dark white. skin. That's right, yeah. I see. What, 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 were you a gunner or were you a pilot? Or? I was a Namara gunner. In other yeah. words, um, I had charge of the uh, machine guns on board. Is this uh, a B-52 or...? Uh, this is a B-17. That's like the bombers that had the glass fortress. in the front with the mm -hmm. machine guns? Machine guns, yeah. Flying fortress. Also, um, part of my job was to uh, fuse the bombs or defuse them. For instance, when we took off on a mission with a bomb load, the bombs were fused and ready to go, but they had a, a cotter pin in them. After we got airborne and got on our way to the target, I had to go in back in the bomb bay, of, up forward in the bomb bay, and release all these pins. And you kept these, they had tags on them, and so you turned them in so that they knew that you had done from your duty. It doesn't happen often, but you also, on, and on the reverse side, you had to put the pins back in again if the bombs were not to be dropped. And that happened coming back from a flight over Germany was uh, what we call a milk run because it was early in the morning, we came back. The planes were not supposed to fly over the over Dover because uh, this was, uh, they were scared that the Germans might uh, repair some B-17s and come over as friendly and bomb England. So you, our uh, instructions were not to fly over this, this certain area. Well, we, 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 we didn't drop our bomb loads, so we're coming back. And I'm back in the bomb bay putting these pins in the bomb, and they're shooting at us. The, the thing, the flak is going off around it because they, the English are shooting at us. I said, God, that's all I need, you know. Hey. But, uh, but you made it safely back. Oh, I made it safely, <laughs> thank God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of you, you've flown a lot of missions. You, you went to Tampa and you received. Education there? Yes, we there. So that was the so the. Um, okay, yeah. wait, no, Ron's gonna ask the question. We got the question already. Right? No, because I don't know okay. where it was on. Okay. You, I cut you in the middle of the question. How did I phrase? Well, you can ask a new question. You can start off new. We can cut in. Okay. okay. We're talking about. Uh, missions that you flew, you flew quite a few missions uh, as as a gunner, is that what you say? Yes, I'm a gunner, yes. An armor gunner. Uh, you had just mentioned uh, about the flak, about being shot at by the English. How many missions did you fly? Were you involved in? And were they top secret missions, any of them? Oh, they're all top secret missions. Uh, um, we, uh, we were to fly 25 missions, and then we would be allowed to go home. And I think we were working on a 23 mission when, when we got shut down. So it was, we only had a few missions to go. Funny part is that it was on January the 13th we flew a mission on a Sunday, and nobody said it's 1945. 1945, and nobody said anything about the date. In the 13th, I'm lucky. Right. We got back, landed, you know, we said, well, we got that one over with. <laughs> the next day we got shut down. So, so, so you're much, flying missions every day almost? Practically. Well, we did in this instance, but uh, it all depends. If a mission is a long mission, sometimes you get up 2, 3 o'clock in the morning on a mission. You have to get up, go to breakfast, go to briefing your ship, check it out, and then you have to fly around in formation and, and, and get get together with the, the other planes and then take off. Where, where were you stationed? Is this in England? In England, Frame, Framingham, Framingham, East Coast, right down Buzz Bob. And that's where these things come over. Yeah. At the time, that were the Germans, you were, you're speaking about the Germans bombing England at the time, sending the, oh, yeah. the rockets oh, and yeah. bombing. So you would fly, is it into France or into Germany from England on these missions? Mostly into Germany. 
the reason I didn't get to go on a, a shuttle mission, but there were a few shuttle missions flown while I was at the base. That is, we would take off from England, bomb Germany, instead of turning around and coming back, fly on to Russia. Or bomb southern Germany and fly on to Italy. Where bus did you land in Russia? They had uh, the small town, small regular regular airfield, you know, nothing that I, I didn't go, so I, I I wouldn't know. But then they'd have a uh, then they have a return. You load up with your bombs in Italy, if you're in Italy, you drop your bombs and, and go return back. And that's uh, in a way it's a lot better because when you go on a bomb run, you don't you have to go on the bomb run. You just have to go right through it. The, the, uh, in terms of being the, mentally prepared for it? Mentally prepared and, and facing the flight that's coming up. Uh, the first mission we flew, they told us a briefing that was going to be, they, they figured how many guns are going to be there, it shouldn't be a hard mission and all that. We had flack all the way and I said, my God, if this is an easy mission, I don't want to see a hard one. Well, they tell us that they brought in some guns with a railroad gun. Well, usually when you're on a mission, you make a U-turn. You go past your, past your target, turn around, and come back so that you're headed home. So that when you drop the bomb, you're on your way. Well, all that time, when you're on your bomb run, you can't go right or left. There's no diversion. You just have to stay right on your bomb run. And that stuff is coming up like it's rattling off the off the wings and cut again. Okay. Wait a five second count from the point roll. Okay, roll. Yeah, can you tell us uh, your experience in guys can just rewind. Five seconds from when I say roll. So count your mind five seconds from okay. the point. Okay. Then ask the question. Okay. Okay, rolling. Yeah, can you tell us some experiences that you had during the basic training? I think that you had Follow Cave Reading that was in basic training with you, Paul Grace. Yeah, I, I met him later at uh, Fort Devens. And uh, he was from West and I was from Providence. And we made friends. And then I left with the group to form a new company, basic training. And Paul stayed. And I later. Where did you leave? Did you I left for Camp Gordon, Georgia. Later, um, Paul Grace arrived at the same camp, but in a different company. And after that, my brother George came to the same camp with a different company. Now, how many brothers do you have? How many brothers? How many Eight br brothers. Eight brothers. And yeah. were all of them in the service? Well, there was uh, myself and uh, Andy was in the Marines, and George was in the Army. Was in Italy in the army, and uh, I think that's Jake. Jake wasn't in yet, but he came no, in later. Yeah, later on, yeah. But he was in the Second World War. Or no, I he think he was in Korean, Korean War, Korean. and he was younger. And one of your, your youngest He's brother, younger. Stanley, yeah, was Stanley in the, came in after in, in the yeah. Korean War as well. In in terms of, you were stationed in an all-black unit in Fort Devens, right? Is that right. correct? Yeah. Um, with the name Barbosa being so unusual, especially with many of the American blacks, possibly from the South or from other places throughout the United States, did they pick up on the name and, and ask you what you were? And, and did you ever get into conversation about being Cape Verde? Well, it, it cut. It didn't seem to make a difference. I think it did with the company commander, which were white officers. But the main ingredients is that I wanted to be a good soldier. Why, why, excuse me, but why did the, the U.S. Army develop segregated troops and put all white officers and no black officers? I mean, what were they trying to do or what were they trying to say to the black soldier by doing that it was better control, they could 
know exactly what's going on if they had white officers over because if the black officer because there was other outfits i remember one time when i was in in camp and this black outfit came in and they were um a heavy weapons company and they were fantastic they had they black officers great outfit and everyone recognized it in the whole camp but i was in in a black outfit with white officers and i was approached by the battalion commander which was a colonel and maybe because of my name and they wanted uh, intelligence reports if there's anything going on in the in the company because he was a battalion commander of the whole battalion but there was two three black outfits in the company but they they want to know what's going on and they they felt you mean that within the camp itself within the camp if if the guys went against you know, if the white officer was putting too much pressure on the black guys and they were ready to revolt and things like that, and they want to know if everything is all right, so they had picked me out, I was a, a staff sergeant at the time, to put in a report once a week, and I, I would just mail it in that, that everything was, was quiet and there was no problems, you see. And, uh, and that's how they they wanted to control because if they have black black uh, they had black outfits after because the 99th uh, infantry division that fought in Italy was an all black outfit. For the most part, black outfits during the Second World War were they used on the front line or were they used as sort of menial jobs to clean up crews, to mop up after an operation, or were they used in the actual fighting? I know that in Italy, uh, even Senator Brooke at the time was involved in, in that front line. And when I had gone to college, uh, some of my professors had were captains, and they were they fought in Italy. But in in the other theaters of the war, were they used basically for menial jobs, black outfits? I wouldn't say menial jobs. They were used as supply outfits. And the few companies that they they made out in the infantry. And they used them sort of like a booby trap in some cases. And in fact, I heard something just the other day that they did the same thing to the Japanese, where they put the Japanese up there in Italy and they put them up in the front line and, and got half of them killed. And then they moved in and they took over the territory. And they were you the mean American Japanese that were using the, Ameri the, the Japanese American outfits. They and, were using uh, the front lines. But, you know, survival. They sort of sacrificed. You know, I'll put uh, the other guy in the front line, I'll put my son in the back. And when the guy takes over, my son will be the hero. <laughs> <laughs> when when you were stationed in the two theaters, the European theater yeah. in Germany, and you went into Germany, right? Yeah. And you went over to Japan as well. Right. Um, when you were in Germany and your outfit ran into other outfits, uh, all white outfits, were there ever any? friction between the two or was there, was there a real closeness there was friction up close to the front lines not as much in the back but in the front lines because I was a chemical warfare outfit to start off with and then they decided that the Germans weren't going to use gas warfare and, and so we couldn't use it either because there was a law and then we got into gasoline supply and in order to supply the tanks and the second army we had to be up close to the front and up close to the front, there was friction, you know, because... Um, when you say friction, this, do you mean like when there was leave and there was, they would go out to... I don't... I, troubles in town? Yeah. Yeah, troubles in town and also troubles when the fellow came up for the gasoline, too, from for the tanks. I mean, he's going to give you a hard time. We had POWs, German prisoners of war, working for us to supply, supply the gasoline for the... For, uh, like the but it was it was controlled friction, and because uh, there was. A did you run into any Cambodians overseas? Yeah, I did run into a couple. I don't remember remember them. I was this in Germany or? Yeah, in Germany, and once one time when we went back for rest in Belgium, and I ran into a couple of them there. And my brother was in England, and uh, Louis was in Italy, so. Marty, did, did you run into any 
cave routings overseas? No, I, no, I didn't. We, uh, we didn't have much. We flew our, our base. With my knowledge, there was none at our base. I ran into a, uh, a fellow schoolmate of mine at my base. He was out of cadre, uh, Jimmy Fox, the attorney, uh, uh, local attorney in here. Um, was a strike up a real friendship. Oh, we used man. to visit each other now and then and um, but when we were flying when we weren't flying we stayed we had uh, one leave of R&R um, uh, &R. we went down to Brighton we dressed up every day and went into town and had tea at the restaurant and, uh, with all these little goodies that they the English put out but um, that was it was there and, and in, the base. In your in your squadron, um, the fact that you're a darker skin individual than other than the, the person that you mentioned, was there any question or did you ever speak about the fact that you were a Cape Verdean? Never never was brought up. Never brought never up. Brought up. No, no mention was ever made of it. At this time when you were in the service, you were how old? Uh, I was the oldest yeah. man on the crew. <laughs> yeah. Pilot and everybody else were younger than I was. I was the oldest one on the crew. Well, I was back in 45, 15, 30 years old. You were 30 years old? 30. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, the bombing run that you were shot down, that whole uh, sort of experience, the fact that what you thought when the plane was hit and going down. Did you crash or did you pass? No, actually, actually we went on a bomb run when we got hit. We had a mission flying into, we were flying for, our target was an oil field west of Berlin. And uh, we got hit by fighters on the way in so that we had a full bomb load and we had enough gas to get to the target and come back to England. So we were, we were pretty well hopped up. Um, to my knowledge, I, found, I have found out later that the navigator in our, uh, in our squadron goofed up so that he got separated from the main group. So that we were flying, our planes were off the and we couldn't get the protection that we would have had had we been all together. So that we got picked off, and uh, we were flying nine-man crew at the time. The only ones that are alive right now that came through this was the uh, bombardier, the tail gunner, and myself. That's one in the tail, one in the nose, and one in the middle. Was That's it a crash? Yeah. Plane blew up. Um, I understand that the uh, a, a plane was on our tail, and our tail gunner said that he hit it, and he feels that the enemy plane came up under us and hit us right in the bomb bay, and that was it. So it, the plane blew up, and then up. And you thing, just landed without a parachute, or next thing I knew, I'm floating through the air. Tinsel all around, <laughs> quiet except for the drone of airplane. And uh, and I reached for that rip cord and I tugged and tugged and nothing happened. Well, on a chest parachute, and that's what we have. The the um, officer use a seat parachute that they sit on. We have a chest parachute, take off and hook back on. I was pulling on the handle to carry the chute with. So I looked down and I saw the red handle. I pulled that and what blossomed out. It so happens, now these are how things happen. Not too long before we made this flight, we had been we were being reissued 45s. When we got to England, they were taken away from us. 45s were taken away from us because they said you had no need for it. But then they got reports that Coming down on parachutes, they were being shot at by the airplanes. 
so they were reissuing 45s. We were supposed to get ours in a day or two, but we were flying missions, so we couldn't get ours, oh. which is probably a good thing, because when I landed, if with a 45, out. I probably would have taken my 45 out, and that would have been the end of me. As it was, we were flying practically five miles up. Um, five miles up? Five miles high, and just tinsel coming down. Then thing blossomed out. I heard and saw a fighter plane, so I slumped in my harness to pretend to be dead or lifeless. And then I must have passed out from lack of oxygen. So the next thing I knew, the ground was coming up and I hit so that I had no time to prepare myself. So I broke both legs. Both legs were broken. And uh, I tried to get up and my leg folded up on me, so I just comes a, a mob with a pickaxe and shovels. And you know, you this can, is Germans that you're speaking about, not, yeah. not German soldiers. Peasants. You know, you can't blame them. You, somebody come over dropping bombs on their country and I wouldn't, you know, um, I wouldn't blame them one bit if they'd knocked my head off, fortunately. So what happened as they surrounded you? Rolling. So what happened after the crowd surrounded you? Uh, we were taken to a uh, we, saying that there were quite a number of planes shot down from our squadron. Um, and uh, I didn't know this. And I was brought into what probably was a jail house, a jail uh, in a small, like a country jail, courthouse and so forth. Whereabouts is this in Germany? Is this, this in Germany, uh, mid-Germany. We're on our way to Berlin, so we're about halfway. Um, I recognized a few fellows from the other, from the other, from my own squadron in, in this uh, in this jail. And um, Which, were you? I think I was scared. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't know what was going on. Well, I knew what was going on. Everything, you know, it, as long as that was one step, get past that. Well, I ended up in the, in the, um, it couldn't have been too far from Berlin because I ended up in a, I have heard of, I, I knew one Texan, who must be six feet six tall, who had a broken leg. What they did, they cut it. And they made a guillotine cut. They, you know, cut it so that then, then, your, then your leg dries up, and your bone sticks out, and you have to go to another operation. So that, because it was easier to take care of. Uh, me, they had because me. he was so tall, too. Well, yeah. probably because he was so tall. He didn't want to go through it all the trouble. Um, I, uh, they had me in traction. Uh, the doctor I had, one of the doctors was Italian. He'd been captured, and he was working in the in, in Berlin hospital. When and you were passing in the city in the ambulance, were you able to see part of Berlin, no. what was going on? No. In the hospital, did you speak with anyone? They were speaking a different language. I, I tried to find out what they're speaking. They said, they say speak in Dutch. Well, I thought they speak in Dutch. <laughs> I didn't know the Dutch Dutch was, was German. Yeah, German yeah. Uh, speak in Dutch. Well, the, this um, when I when I woke up uh, after being had a cast put on my leg, first time I had a cast put on, I wondered what, the, how the heck did I get into this thing? You know, hot as a rocket. And uh, the Italian doctor, I said, Padra, stone. He said, ah, Italian piadra. He, almost the same thing in Italian. Yeah. Um, so do you, you speak Creole fluently? No, I but pick up here. And was that your first language that you learned, Creole, before you learned English? Probably, yes, yeah. So that it's really helped you in this situation. It didn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I 
gun, eh? Then they brought. And that bomber there. Meet us right and to let him know to substantiate the that he was in the that he was shot down and that well, when that was. I've never heard from him since I don't know whether he's from Texas or not. But the uh, the other fellow, the tail gunner is from Nashville, Tennessee. Ham Hall, you know, old country western. Yeah. And uh, he's been up visited with us and stayed with us and we've been down to uh, Tennessee and been around. When you were in the hospital, after you recovered, you were taken to a prison of camp? I was, yes, after, after, um, I was in the hospital. But one of the experiences in Berlin Hospital was if there was an air raid coming, they moved the German prison, German patients, patients. to safety. But the there. Americans <laughs> stayed right there, right by a big window. All that glass, and, oh God, no. And, and um, tried not to bomb hospitals, but the Germans would put the hospitals near the factories to try to keep the, you know, uh, keep them away. Keep them honest. <laughs> uh, then uh, there was another instance where the Russians were beating the devil out of the Germans. The, East Coast. The city was full of refugees coming back away from the front. Well, I got shipped to uh, to a starlight to a prison camp. What is, is that starlight? Does that mean prison camp? I mean prison camp. Yeah. Well, and they have different numbers. You're right. Yes. Yeah. They have work camps. They have prison camps. Um, I, I can remember they put me, they laid me down by a railroad station out, in the, out on the ground. And nobody watched me because I couldn't go anywhere. I had both legs and cash. But I can remember a, a group of Russian prisoners going by. And uh, they uh, made a little bundle and threw it to me as they went by. Cigarettes, you know, they thought uh -huh. I'd see that smoke. Uh, so the Russians themselves, the people, I think are great. The government, the ideology that's uh, somewhat warped. Anyway, this prison camp that I went to was run entirely by American and English personnel. How do you mean run? You mean doctors, oh, okay. cooks, nurses, whatever. The uh, they had prison guards, the German guards, but this big outfit was um, doctors that had been captured and. And uh, that, that was my first. How large of a prison camp is this? Well, it's was quite it? a, well, a good sized prison camp. I, a I, thousand I people? It was like a big barn, triple decker. Sometime when the air raids came over, you want to see those guys on the third bunk get down now, on the floor <laughs> quick, quickly. Uh, that was my first uh, introduction to sodium pentothal. Oh, man. I don't know if you ever had sodium pentothal, but. Where I was not a drinker, uh, it knocks you out easily, and you're in a so that every time since when I've had to go through. An they they mix it with yeah. something else, but. Um, so all this time that that you were captured, you must have thought about back home. You were, you were oh. a married man at the time, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. And your wife may not... Uh, word was sent that you were mission... When word came that you were alive? Um... He's the son of we started getting more. Guys were leaving. The, um, pretty soon. Um, this is 1945. 45. Pretty soon the. Um, 
case rolled in and uh, rolled in, put it on truck. You're talking about American, American tanks? American tanks. Tank. Patton's, Patton's, I don't know which, which branch, but it was Patton's Army. Part of Patton's uh, spearhead there. In with the infantry that was, came along with this group was a fellow from the Bedford that I played football with, Bernie Messier. The Murph Club, we went to school together. And uh, when they got back, he says when they get back from day's work or whatever, and say, uh, hey, you know there's somebody here from, we, we saw somebody from uh, because usually when you're, in, you're from Boston. Right, yeah. Because that's, uh, that's nobody knows if Haven or New Bedford, you know. Right. Hey, Boston, then you can clarify and get down a little closer. Uh, so Bernie, Bernie knew right away that I had been, um, that I was alive. And um, some reporter, from the New York, from the Boston paper, reported that I was alive. My wife was working at the time at Hutchinson's, which was way to change the salt marsh. And uh, somebody came down and gave her the news. But uh, as I understand it, the news came that I was alive the same day that my brother knew that he was killed in Italy. So, it, you know. Did you go in the same time, you and your brother, or was your brother younger than you? He was younger, but I went in before I did. I had started getting some training with OSS, which I probably should have been um, so The time for um, being called in was probably delayed until that was you a couple of questions concerning uh, your stay in Georgia because from Georgia you had mentioned to me once before that you were going to be sent to officer training just about the time you received orders to go overseas. Right, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Cut. <laughs> Dad, can you tell us a little bit about um, in Georgia where you were stationed? You had orders to report to officer training school. Uh, so about that experience. Yeah, well, that was uh, after I left Georgia and basic training, I went to uh, Camp Cybert, Alabama. And uh, while I was there, this officer suggested to me that I should try to go to officer's training school. So I told him a couple of fellows had tried and they didn't, they didn't pass the board. I said, how am I going to pass the board? Are you selected or are you, you can well, sign up? Well, they pick you out as a good soldier. They figure they, how would you like to try it? He, he figured that, uh, he said, they're making a gasoline supply company. He said, you don't want a gasoline supply company. You should go to officer's training school. So I told him I didn't think I could pass the board because this, this other fellow had gone and he was pretty smart and he didn't pass the board. He says, look, you can make it. Just believe that you can make it. And you go up and act like you normally act on the field and there's no way that you can miss, miss it. So I went up against the board and I passed. Is it a written test or you, this is yeah, more It was a different. They asked you questions thing. and it was written and uh, seeing if you know all the things about, about Army. If you go to officer's that. training school, what type of rank do you come up with? You come out a second lieutenant, and uh, then you pick an alternate. You pick what you'd like to go into, and then an alternate. And I had picked chemical warfare and, and infantry. And one other fellow had done that, that passed, and he was an in infantry in Italy. So I went and I passed the board, and, and uh, they told me, and I got a letter from uh, the General of Army Ground Forces, and and. Uh, in the East Coast, and but just after that letter came in, the company got alerted for overseas duty. But if a company gets alerted for overseas duty, they don't pull anybody Super off the ranks. Supersedes everything. So, so where were you going I, overseas? Where were you going to be stationed? Well, we went to um, to France and then to Aachen, Germany, and then we we went into Dusseldorf. And then after the war ended, 
We went back to southern France. This is around <coughs> the tail end of the Second World War. When this you was were in 1944, in. I believe. Yeah. So this part of Germany is a part that that the United States had control over. Where you were going? Well, in. I was in there when the Battle of the Bulge broke out, where the Germans came back. And then after they they shipped us, they needed troops up in, in the Pacific, so they the war was the war was still going on. But they sent you from Germany. From Germany, went to southern France and took a boat from southern France and <coughs> and uh, went through the Rock of Gibraltar and through the Panama Canal down to you the Philippines. Suez Canal. No, not the Suez Canal. Oh, you went the other way. The other way, yeah. Rock of Gibraltar, across the Atlantic, oh. down to the Panama Canal, to the Pacific, and then we went up Did to the uh, Philippines. You went into the Philippines? Yeah. We stayed in the Philippines and waited until, uh, you know, because they were going to invade uh, Japan. We were sure we were going to get killed, because I figured the Japanese would never quit. Is it isn't it unusual for an outfit to go to two two of those war theaters? The study the thing and figure where they need you and when when the war ended, where were you at the time the war ended? Well, when the war ended, I was on on the way to Japan, and we got into Japan right after the war. Ended. Were you there a, a while? Uh, yeah, I stayed there and uh, I was in Yokohama. And then they. I had one boy and I. And, uh, so. Soldier, because I remember walking to where it was all bombed, and I and I saw that if they caught me up that late at night, they touched me. And the thing is, we went beyond where the troops were. When the emperor said it's over, it's over. You had you had spoken to me about the train system, where the train systems are so packed with people. Yet when the American soldiers would come over, they would sort of spread out and give yeah. them room. I'm a short man, but I felt tall when I was in Japan. Because <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> the average Japanese is a little shorter than I am. Well, you could be the same size, but I remember I asked this girl I wanted to. Buy for kimonos. We took the train in town and, and the train is jammed. I'm standing there when this gate opens and all I have to do is move forward and everybody just opens up. And I really felt like I was powerful. <laughs> I was in the Philippines, and I felt that the Fil the Philippine was good to us, but not as much as the Japanese. You had, I remember as as a young boy, you you had several times. You had a German Luger, yeah, uh, and I remember.
remember you teaching us how to take it apart. Get the line. They told me a story once about the 45, how they developed. Do you remember that? Developed the gun. Who developed the gun? The the Americans, the 45. Ed, do you know that? About no, I, I, I I'm not sure I if my information is correct, but yeah. if I remember correctly, that in the Philippines, some of the people that were fighting against the Americans, the Philippines, they would use some type of drug so that. When you would shoot them and they would get hit, they could still keep coming because they didn't feel the pain and so forth. So they developed the gun, the 45, to knock the person down. Yeah, the 45 was inaccurate, but it could really knock it down. But the Japanese had a Luga too, and their Luga, but uh, was not as, as as good as the German Luga. It was more rough because they had a, a, a Japanese Luga too. They refined all those things after, like the cameras and the things like that. They passed the Germans on the lenses and things like that. When you arrived from the war to the States, what type of your reading it was for you? Well, I remember flying over and landing in, in, in California. And, uh, You asked the question about uh, if if I said I was Cape Verdean, and you know it wasn't. I guess because I'm the first generation born in America, we wanted to be American so much. So it wasn't inter you know that much. But when I arrived in in California, I I met a couple of friends there. We came back on a ship. down the street and he says, I said, you wise. He says, you want some jaggies and I'll bring you home. <laughs> and he, he happened to be my, my brother's godfather and I never knew him. John The only time rolling. So uh, we went to his house. Much culture came into things. W we lived the culture so that you know it was kind of nice to get away from it, and because it was so much of it because it was so old-fashioned. But now those things are coming. You know, so they, because the whole country emphasizes different cultures from different nationalities. You make an interesting point there because up to that time, many of the Cape Verdean families that came from the islands, they came directly to a city like New Bedford, if not New Bedford, live within the community, the South End, where most of them grew up, and stayed almost there, either worked there or worked outside of the community, came back in. Many of them didn't learn English until much later. So really the first experience or real true experience of Cape Verdeans had with the rest of America is when when the young men joined the armed services and went overseas. So really this kind of interview is sort of a dedication to that because it really opened up Cape Verde or Cape Verdeans to the rest of America by young men like the both of you going to the Second World War and then bringing back experiences to the community, bringing back memories and bringing back glory as well. Monty, can you tell us a little bit about your homecoming? Uh, My homecoming was not very uh, spacious. We, uh, of course, I had broken legs, bro both legs broken, and uh, they decided to send me back to uh, the States to be treated. So that uh, we were loaded on a plane. Now, I had said I'd never fly again, but. I, had, I didn't have much choice and I wasn't going to fight not going home. So, uh, my first, we ended up at Pauline's, New York, which is an Air Force 
hospital, but not full scale. They, they couldn't, they, the, the uh, treatment I needed, they couldn't provide. So that I was sent from, from there to um, Staten Island, New York. And of course, being moved around with the, in the stretcher and, uh, and, and ambulances, Was your wife notified to meet you at the hospital? Or My wife was they notified, and um, they went up to me. They went up with uh, Mickey Dyer, who we are still friends with. And in fact, we go to breakfast almost every Sunday morning together. Mickey Dyer and I played football together on the Murph Club. And um, his wife and my wife have been friends since high school days when they used to watch us playing ball at the time. So was back quite a while. So we sent it down to Staten Island and I, I, um, I used to see the doctor, the doctor in Germany, we had one, he was either Australia or New Zealand, the head doctor, who made his rounds every single night. He saw a patient every night for turning in. You get up to Paul up to um, um not Paul. Get up to Staten Island. Get up to Staten Island Wednesday the doctors are playing golf. So I used to sign my own <laughs> sign, sign my own receipt to go and get my X rays taken. Yeah. You know, it's quite a change. You know. Yeah. Interview, I think it uh, will become part of our archives and perhaps in years to come. 